Welcome everyone. I am Laura Sakin, Manager of Preservation and Outreach at Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to go over a few technical stuff. Please keep your videos off during the talk. If your video is on, we will turn it off. You are, however, welcome to turn your video on at the end of the talk for the Q&A section. Additionally, you will be muted throughout the event. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so via chat. This event is sponsored by Friends and is part of the Municipal Arts Society Jane's Walk Week. So if you're new to us, Friends is an almost 40 year old organization dedicated to the preservation and celebration of their architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. Back in the 1980s, when we were founded, MAS saw the need for additional local community groups supporting preservation in the city. And Friends was one of the many watchdog organizations incubated by MAS. And our very first office was located and none other than the Barbizon. Tonight, we welcome Paulina Bren, author of The Barbizon, The Hotel That Set Women Free. Paulina is an award-winning writer and historian who teaches at Vassar College. She's also a well-known scholar and everyday life and uh, of everyday life and communism behind the Iron Curtain. Paulina. Hello, thank you so much for introducing me. And hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. And I am going to talk for a while and then open up for Q&A. And I am going to share my screen because it's always good to show pretty pictures, I believe, when speaking, especially over Zoom, which can be an unpleasant experience, um, which I'm quite familiar with since I am teaching at Vassar. Um, so I have been Zooming for a year and a half now. So I'm going to be talking about my book today, uh, The Barbazon, The Hotel That Set Women Free. Some of you might already actually have read it. Um, I'm not sure. Um, here is my email. If you'd like to email me, I have since the book came out, um, it came out March 4th in the US and March 18th in the UK. Um, so I do get emails from people and most of them have to be, have, have been very, very interesting actually. Um, so the Barbizon, um, hold, hold on, let me see if I can move this thing along. Um, I'm guessing most of you have heard about the Barbizon Hotel on the Upper East Side. Um, it certainly always had a reputation for being exactly as this matchbook says here, New York's most exclusive residence for young women. And I'm gonna start by talking about the hotel, sort of the, the, the vibe, the, the atmosphere, the um, sort of the flavor it tried to give off. And it was, it was legitimate, but then I'll also talk about how it was more in terms of living there and the women who lived there. Um, okay. So how did I come to the Barbizon? Obviously, I'm, I'm curious to then hear how some of you have heard about the Barbizon Hotel. For many people, uh, me included, it really came about first when I read The Bell Jar. And of course, famously, Sylvia Plath uh, wrote about her experience at the Barbizon and at Mademoiselle Magazine, and we'll get to that. Um, she was there in 1953 and she wrote a novel about it in 1963. Though I have to say, um, speaking with her cohorts there in 1953, I would say the bell jar is actually very accurate in terms of her experience there, which was not altogether positive. So when I read The Bell Jar, I was fascinated by the scene. It's a famous scene, and again, a truthful scene, um, where her, the protagonist, Esther, 
goes to the roof of this hotel and throws her entire wardrobe off the roof onto the street below. And I was sort of really interested in that moment and interested in what kind of hotel this was where you walk to the roof and throw your entire wardrobe over. So that was rather interesting to me. Um, and it was, it was sort of part of one of the sort of ways that I was led to this topic. Um, I also, I should say it's, it's, it's interesting, I'm speaking to the friends of the Upper East Side um, because indeed uh, your group was quite instrumental in, in making sure that the hotel would be landmarked. Um, and Tara Kelly, I suppose, who's your former executive director, um, this is a snippet from a newspaper clipping. Um, but what she says here is something that I was certainly also interested in when I started out the research. Uh, she said that it feels important that the building is designated because it has a social importance, not only because of the many famous women who lived in the building, but also for the hundreds of everyday women coming to the city, looking to make something of themselves. And indeed, I mean, this is something that very much interests me. If you do read the book, um, you'll see that sort of the, as the stories and the narratives, um, one of course can go much deeper into that in the book, you'll see that I'm just as interested in the famous women as the unfamous women, you could say. Um, so, oh, and I, I did want to say also, and we, we will sort of uh, track back to this. So as a historian wanting to do the history of a place, obviously there's just so much you could say about it place. Um, certainly it's setting. I mean, this is a history of a hotel. It's a history of New York through the 20th century and a history of the women who went there and ultimately of women's ambition through the 20th century, what it meant, um, how it could flourish, how it was curtailed and so forth. So the, the research, um, when I went into this project, um, I thought, wonderful, this famous glamorous hotel, there must be so much out there about this hotel. And no, it turns out there were many people who had tried to write this book before and gave up. And there was a very good reason they gave up. As far as I could find, there were really no remaining archival documents, which is very important to a historian. So this was research that took quite a number of years as I tried to find former residents and all sorts of sort of a multitude of very diverse sources as a way to sort of rebuild this hotel, you could say, from the ground up. So the hotel was built in 1927, opened its doors in 1928. Here we have a photograph of a certainly a day gone, you know, long gone in New York. Um, I believe this is 63rd, Lexington is going the other way. Um, 1920s was a fascinating time because lots of women's only hotels were being built in Manhattan at this time. This was after World War I, women had gotten the vote, thousands were coming to New York and they wanted modern places to live. And these residential hotels had already existed um, for a couple of decades for men. And a lot of those developers now saw the ability to make profit from a new kind of client. And so these buildings went up. And obviously, um, for the Barbizon, it had a very distinct flavor that it was and a distinct clientele it was aiming for. Um, this was a postcard that we, back in the day, I'm not sure if it's the case anymore, I don't think so. But back in the day, I certainly remember it when one would check into a hotel, there was a postcard of the hotel in the in the desk drawer. And you could send it home to loved ones. And it was a form of advertising as well. And this was the postcard that that lasted for decades. Um, what I always find funny about it is that the amount of women I spoke to who who said that they saw this postcard, they looked around their room and they, they would write home, Janet Barraway, the writer, she wrote home and said, it's an outrage. My room looks nothing like this. It's half the size at best. So a little false advertising there. Um, this is a 1936 brochure. And again, we're talking now about how the hotel wanted to portray itself. Um, 
1936 brochure, um, the, the map on the left, which is a very sort of, <laughs> very, <laughs> um, um, sort of a fantasy map in many ways. I love the way that everything is so close together, the theaters, the smart shops and Carnegie Hall and the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I love how that's all so, so very close to what was on there. Um, but this kind of mapping continued actually well into the 80s. Um, not that everything continued well into the 80s. Another, I want to show you this brochure because there is actually a fine photograph here of the original um, lobby, which was sort of considered Italianate with a mezzanine in laid floors, a mezzanine uh, which I thought was rather wonderful because the young women would sort of peek over, look at, check out their dates, check out others' dates. And here on the right, you see how from the get-go, the hotel really was aiming to go after a clientele that was sort of artistically um, sort of motivated, that imagined a career in the art. So as you see here, um, it says you will find congenial devotees among your neighbors and helpful guidance from our social director. She is anxious to arrange social activities and introductions for those who wish to meet other residents. You will enjoy every possible facility, including rehearsal rooms, soundproof practice rooms for piano, voice and violin and studios for painting and sculpture. There's an art gallery in the building, uh, recitals, dramatic productions arranged in the recital room and so forth and so on. So it was really set up as an art center and that's how it was different from um, the other hotels that were going up at this time. A lot of them geared toward uh, business women. Um, this was geared toward young women who were going to be in the arts. And uh, just to continue here on the right is a more um, honest portrayal of a, of a regular room, as you can see, it's a little bit narrower, though I think this was still sort of a slight slip, step up. Um, and the famous swimming pool, um, I'm sure a lot of you uh, live in the area of the Barbizon, if not even in the Barbizon. Um, and it is now the Equinox, though they do not have the original pool, they pulled that out. And I should say men were not allowed beyond the lobby. Um, what you see here on the other hand, father taking his daughter, it seems out to dinner, um, there was an area, sort of a rooftop area, where if you got a pass, you could take a man up there for a meal. Um, but other than that, men were not allowed. And of course, throughout the decades, many men claimed that they had somehow managed to get up to the bedrooms. Uh, Malachi McCourt being one of them, um, and I sort of do believe him. Um, interestingly, the coffee shop, uh, which was a famous uh, part of the Barbizon too, uh, that anybody could use. It's interesting, 1936, it was already air conditioned, I see here in the brochure. Um, and to give you a sense of the advertising, as I said, the way it was presenting itself. And not just obviously to New York, this was a hotel for young women from out of town. This is a New York hotel for small town America in so many ways. And particularly once we get into the 1930s and the Great Depression, which I'll get to, it becomes that kind of hotel. Uh, but the whole, but throughout its, its existence, it's certainly catering to this notion of itself as a very glamorous place, as a place for these young women who can make connections with others like themselves. Um, so here we have some ads from the 1940s. This is important here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, um, but it says here, um, because why? Because the serene atmosphere, many cultural and physical activities and the freedom from housekeeping cares make living here ideal. This is actually very important. In the 1920s, when these hotels went up, um, the Barbizon uh, representatives actually very clearly said, this is, this is a hotel to liberate women. And one of the ways we're doing that, there are no kitchens. Now, on the one hand, that actually made it possible to build these hotels. It was a law. There were no kitchens, no fire hazards. You could build in a certain way. But it was also very much billed as being liberating to women that they would not have to do these womanly chores would not have to take care of others. They could take care of themselves and their own ambitions. 
Um, and here, 1950s, um, you start to see um, in this ad, it says you'll meet uh, friends, women like you, maybe some of them will already be your classmates. In 1950s, you see a lot of this sort of Mount Holyoke references, now a model at J. Thorpe, um, and so forth. Just checking the time. Oops. Um, and I'll skip over here. So this is this is how the hotel is is built. This is how the hotel presents itself. This is the hotel's legacy, in many ways. But in fact, it's more interesting. is It's more layered. It, it's more complex. So the hotel opens its doors in 1928, as you saw in that rather abandoned-looking 63rd Street. Um, and the Great Depression hits. The, great, the crash happens a year, basically a year later, and the Great Depression of, through the 1930s is of course building up and these are scenes from New York. So now, first of all, the, the Barbizon, unlike a lot of other women's hotels, it actually survives, it pivots. And it survives because I think, um, one, yes, it continues the sheen of the glamorous and the young women, certainly. But what it also does, it starts to really cater to career women in a very serious way. So this was a time when women, the same kind of women who, who were coming here for fun before, now they were coming to New York and to stay at the Barbizon because they needed a job. They needed to either make a living for themselves or also make a living uh, for their families back home. And at the same time, to be a woman uh, during the Great Depression and be seen as working, you were considered to be taking the job of a man, so that a man had the right um, as the breadwinner, the family breadwinner to have a job. And in fact, the government had to put out uh, messages saying no women are not working for pin money as, as was sort of the, the, um, the rumor. So well, who filled up this hotel in the 1930s? Two particularly large sort of chunks of, of rooms were taken up, one by Katie Gibbs girls, and I'm guessing most of you know Catherine Gibbs secretarial school, although if I were asking, you know, 20 year olds, 15 year olds, um, or my 16 year old, they would certainly have no idea. Um, but it was obviously a very sort of posh secretarial school begun by Catherine Gibbs, founded by Catherine Gibbs in the early 1900s. She was very good at marketing. Um, it, she did very well, but when the Great Depression hit, this became the place where all these young ladies from Mount Holyoke, from Barnard and so forth, they need to get a job. Their English degree wasn't going to get it, but a certificate from, Ka from Catherine Gibbs was going to get it. And Gibbs actually, they opened up, they took over two and then later three floors of the Barbizon as a dormitory. So the working Gibbs girls, these working women training to be secretaries, their way of getting stable jobs, that was a big portion of the residents. The other portion of residents was Powers models, Powers girls. Uh, John Powers created the first modeling agency in America in the early 1920s. Um, and, and these were, again, these were working models. These were not supermodels. It was a tough job in many ways. But what was interesting to see is the women who are, who are able to work, who are occupying the Barbizon, are women who are taking up what are seen as feminine professions in the sense that they can't be accused as much of taking these jobs away from men. So you have this sort of this, this complex um, dynamic of women, work, ambition, survival taking place. And then of course we have the other side, the side that's known very well uh, about the sort of through the Barbizon is of course the famous women who stayed at the Barbizon. Um, so we have this photo here of, of Oscar. He was a very famous doorman. And it was funny, I was, um, I was talking on, on NPR on um, Alison Stewart um, and they did call-ins and the second call-in was actually Oscar's uh, grandson. So that was, that was wonderful. Uh, so he had, I mean, for generations, women would talk about Oscar. Um, so he was the gatekeeper and he was the gatekeeper for whom in terms of famous women? Well, here are just uh, three of them, Sybil Shepherd, Grace Kelly, Felicia Rashad. Um, and I'll go through just a few of them since time is just trickling away. Um, Grace Kelly uh, came there after World War II 
And it was interesting. She, when she arrived, um, she was from Philadelphia. And this was the other thing that um, in doing the research, um, on the one hand, this was a hotel of, of, obviously this was America, this was the time period. This was a hotel of whiteness, of white women up until a certain point um, in time. But it was, it was seen as an elite hotel and yet socioeconomically, it was a tremendous mix. So we had Grace Kelly here who um, was very pleased. She didn't get into Bennington, convinced her parents that she could go to New York and study drama. Um, her father was a self-made millionaire in Philadelphia. He was paying for uh, the room and the lessons. She was known for um, dressing in a very sort of dowdy or one could say conservative tweedy way, uh, while at the same time having a very outgoing personality and she would actually apparently uh, dance topless down the hallways with the barbers on. Um, and her next door sort of room next door neighbor and became her best friend was a woman called Carolyn Scott, who was from rural Ohio working class. She put together, uh, she saved money through a beauty competition that she won, which was a very common phenomenon. And she came to New York determined to become a model and indeed she became a model. And in the book, I set up a lot of these situations where you have somebody famous like Grace Kelly, but I put them beside a friend who was at the Barbizon with them to sort of show just how much the famous women at the Barbizon were really a product of their time. We tend to see them as unique, but you, you in, in, in seeing them in their young selves, uh, lacking confidence, not knowing what was happening and being really as much in the throes of all the pressures of the 1950s, um, just like Carolyn Scott was, um, of, of no matter how ambitious you were, um, marriage had to be the end goal and, and your window of opportunity was very short. And here uh, we have them together here. And also on the right is lobby um, of the hotel, which I, I think this is a wonderful uh, photograph. We have the, which I'll talk about later, the older women gossiping, looking on and gossiping here. And actually uh, the daughter of Carolyn Scott, when she saw this in the book, um, she was thrilled because she'd only seen the photograph cut off here before. And she discovered that it's actually her mother looking down. So that's Carolyn Scott there. Um, a real sort of a way, as I say, the, the research was incredibly difficult, um, but a real gateway to it, um, just as actually it was a gateway to the Barbizon, but it was a gateway for me to, to get at the history of the Barbizon was through Mademoiselle Magazine. Now, again, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure who my audience is here, but, um, it was fascinating to me because in my day, um, sort of in the 80s, I remember Mademoiselle magazine as this sort of very sort of like 17 magazine, this very fluffy, um, not very interesting at all. In fact, a teenage uh, magazine. But I discovered that from its inception in the mid 1930s up until, let's say, sort of the 1970s, it was a real phenomenon, um, and especially the August College issue. It was called the Bible. No, no young woman would go to college without having read it. And it combined fashion and practical fashion, affordable fashion with cutting edge literature. Writers, famous writers wrote for Mademoiselle. And in some ways it's because they didn't have a large budget. So they had to find the up and coming who later became famous. Um, but it, it, was, it was a phenomenon. And the, who was also a phenomenon was Betsy Talbot Blackwell who went by BTB. She always wore hats, she was known for that. So here she is on the left of the group picture and on the right uh, wearing a signature hat. Um, she came to the magazine with its inception 1935. She was at its helm until 1970. She was brilliant um, and she, I could talk about her for ages, but I won't. But what she created was the college issue, which meant that what was considered usually a dead month in magazine publishing became the, their best month. And she devised this idea that they would have young women all across America reporting back to them about what they were thinking, what they wanted to buy, what they were talking about, which of course for advertisers was just a dream. 
Um, and then she created the guest editor contest, which became one of the most prestigious vehicles in the United States for any ambitious young woman. And if you won it, and it was very hard to win, and it was always sort of the cream of the crop, um, if you won it, you were brought to New York for the month of June and you lived at the Barbizon and you were wined and dined in New York and you followed, you shadowed the editors at Mademoiselle Magazine. And it was through this contest that we had Sylvia Plath there in 1953. I'm going to go quickly through this now. Um, we had Joan Didion there in 1955. Ali McGraw in 1958, and she was the first guest editor who actually made it to the front cover. She came in as an artist and left a model and then became an actress. Betsy Johnson, the designer, uh, was there in 1964. Now, what's fascinating is um, when I was doing the research, as I say, it was a, ho it was, it was a white hotel. Um, but the question of course becomes in New York, you know, when, when does a woman of color first stay at the hotel? And how to find that if, if you don't have any archival sources left? Well, um, I think I managed to find the first woman. Her name was Barbara Chase. I managed to find her because Betsy Talbot Blackwell's papers, nothing personal, rather her memos and office papers from her days at Mademoiselle are at an archive in Laramie, Wyoming. And I was going through thousands of memos one day and I suddenly see this, this heated debate taking place among the staff of Mademoiselle Magazine. And the heated debate was this, there was a contestant, Barbara Chase, um, and she, they decided she was the best artist um, applicant by far. She was very good looking, but there was the problem that she was African-American, she was black. And they were debating and, and Betsy Talbot Blackwell kept insisting that they invite her. Um, the business side of Mademoiselle were not happy. They were saying, we're going to lose readership in the South. We're gonna lose, lose uh, advertisers in the South. And then the big question came up, will the Barbizon even let her in? Uh, well, Mademoiselle brought her and the Barbizon let her in. Um, I can talk more about that, but um, she became also Barbara Chase Rabo, which she told me actually, she hyphenated her name because uh, she was so fascinated by Bel Betsy Talbot Blackwell that she did not that Betsy did not get rid of Talbot. Um, so she did the same. Um, and you can go see some of her pieces at MoMA and she's, she's quite amazing. Um, so the 1960s, um, on the one hand, this was a hotel to liberate women. On the other hand, women's liberation became the nail in the coffin for the Barbizon. Um, as women were feeling more liberated outside of the walls of the Barbizon, they did not want to stay in a place where you could not bring men, uh, that were a place that was sort of stale and um, increasingly also uh, filled with some older women who were known as the women. And they were throughout Barbizon's history, they, the women were the older women that no young woman wanted to become because the Barbizon was supposed to be a launching pad. And if you were still there at a certain age, it meant you did not launch. It also meant you did not get married. So they were really, they were sort of <laughs> the, the everything you don't want to be, right? Um, in the 1960s, you sort of see this as a wonderful picture. We, this woman, um, I forget her name right now, but she, um, she was always at tea time uh, playing the organ. Look at this remarkable, oops, oops, sorry, um, this remarkable organ. Um, and then you have these younger ladies from the 60s here, um, a model in the 60s at the coffee shop. Um, and then of course, 1970s, Meg Walser wrote a beautiful piece about staying. She was the last of the last group of guest editors in 1979. And she said, New York looked like an episode of Kojak. Um, and there was a hole in the ceiling in the lobby of the Barbizon and everything was sort of in disarray. Um, 1980s, you can, again, you can see the women on the benches. Um, they would just sort of park themselves and, 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 and talk about all the young women that they saw. So what happened was in 1981, um, it was no longer feasible. The occupancy rates were down and it wasn't feasible to continue a female only hotel. 
Um, and so it had to become a regular hotel and it had to bring in men. So it actually in 1981, Valentine's Day, there was a big raffle and a big, you know, brouhaha thing. And um, the first man ever to officially be allowed to go into the Barbizon beyond the lobby was given the keys. Um, but very shortly after that happened, um, the hotel actually closed. And over the next 20 years, it went through various renovations and versions of being a regular hotel. And I have some, um, sorry for, for, you can see all the shadowing here. I was taking these pictures actually in the lobby of the Barbizon 63 and there's this light um, and the, uh, there was nowhere else I could take these photographs. So the 1990s in its various um, incarnations as a hotel that was supposed to cater to simply tourists um early 2000s um it all has it all has the flavor of the 90s and the 2000s um and of course the women as i was just as i was just mentioning um and so what happened in 2005 was of course as we all know um the property prices real estate was shooting up and many um, many hotel owners decided it'd be better to um, turn their hotels into condos. And that's what happened to the Barbizon. And what's fascinating about these women is that they, when, when the hotel started to sort of become a hotel in the 1980s and started to see these different renovations, they hired a tenant lawyer and to fight it. And at that point, there were still about 150 of these women there. And what was discovered was that their rooms were rent control. Um, and so they couldn't be moved. And so as these hotels, as the hotel was being renovated over various phases over two decades, um, they were still in their rooms and there was sort of a wall that was built and then the rest of the new hotel was there and then you'd open a door and the women on different floors were behind that in their regular rooms. Um, so it's fascinating and I have a feeling some of you might actually be able to tell me more about that. Um, I did start out my research um, in 2015 by trying to contact these women and the ringleader was having none of it um, because uh, she was uh, writing a memoir and I hope she still is writing a memoir about the Barbizon. I personally would love to read it, um, but she did not want to share. Um, but I do know that they've, they've read or are reading the book. I, I have been told that, so I'm aware of that. There are five women left at this point. And when the hotel was completely gutted to become Barbizon 63, you can see the lobby on the right, Ricky Gervais, who owns an apartment there, I believe. Um, so they actually got new apartments um, on, I believe, I believe it's the fourth floor. Um, so I always say, you know, they were seen as losers. I see them as victors. They live in rent control apartments on the Upper East Side and they have daily cleaning service as well. That is part of sort of the hotel contract, which had to continue um, as they became tenants, continued tenants in these hotels and now in the condo. Um, I try to make that fast um, so that we'd have time for Q&A. Um, so I think I will, this is my book. Um, and I'm going to stop share. I'm going to see if people have questions. Okay, Hi. I would love to hear comments too. I mean, yeah. I, mm -hmm. this was wonderful. We're so excited uh, to learn about all of them, to read your book for those who haven't. I dropped the link um, on the chat if you want to order the book. And we do have questions. I'd like to remind you, if you'd like to ask a question, please use Sylvia chat. If you wanna, I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, back and forth of people who used to live at the Barbizon here. So I guess we'll open up the floor a little bit for people to talk instead of asking questions. But before we ask questions, I want to invite um, a friend, uh, Vice President Rita Chu, who would like to say a few words about the time that Friends was um, 
uh, was the Barbizon. Rita? Yep. I, I really, really enjoyed that talk. And I'm dying to hear from those uh, ladies who were there uh, in 1992. I am too. <laughs> but I just want to say a few words that um, I'm a founding a board member of Friends. And I only mentioned that because I was there in 1982 when our very first office was at the Barbizon. And this was due to the fact that one of our fellow board members was a part owner. So we got our space for free for at least maybe a year or two, I don't remember. But um, we were in a wing where the, late, the women were. But it's my impression that they were already um, uh, moved to a, a new wing that was recently renovated because I remember seeing their rooms and they were very proud of their rooms. They were small, but they were so cheery looking. They didn't look cluttered. I don't know how they were able to survive in such a small <laughs> space. But, and you're right, there was no bathroom. You had to go down, go down yeah. the hall and everything. But at the time, 1982, I had the impression that they were only down to like 20. And you're absolutely right. It was because of rent control that they were able to stay on. Um, I do want to mention that when, as you were talking, you sort of reminded me of my days at Vassar because <laughs> I had a tiny room. I had no bathroom. It was down the hall. Men were not allowed in your room. And the men would, could only stay in the lobby. And there was a woman there at the front desk. I think she was called the White Angel that prevented men from going upstairs. I think I've just- yeah, May, May Sibley, May Sibley was there for a long time, but I'm not sure if she was there then. But absolutely, I mean, this is why women didn't want to stay there once the, sort of the women's movement had taken place. Yes. They felt they could live elsewhere because it was, there were these beautiful opulent public areas and all the yes. women's hotels were built this way, but the rooms were, were pokey. That's why they complained when for the postcard. But they were but, very warm and all that. And to tell you how small it was, our office, when a moving man came to deliver a word processor, he said, my bathroom's bigger than this room. That's it, that's <laughs> exactly. all I have to say. Oh, one last thing. I love Tara, who was our former executive director, but I don't believe she was quite accurate. I've lived in this neighborhood for 40 years. I believe that when they start, first started renovating, they changed the uh, win, uh, the uh, storefront windows on the Lexington side. They did, yes. exactly. This is absolutely true. I mean, this idea, I know, I'm glad you brought this <laughs> up because they, first of all, they gutted the inside. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, in, 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 pretty brutally. But yes, they knew they could, they, you know, this, as you all know, these these are luxury condos. Yes, they had to create, and they had lower ceilings than a lot of opulent yes. buildings, and so they had to create the sense of of sort Opulous. of largesse and of airiness. So they yeah. did. They pulled out the windows and they created these yeah. these huge windows um, in order to create that sense of you know of the yeah. price tag. Yeah, I worry that you're absolutely right. Restricted from being designated a landmark. So I love yeah. to hear from the other women. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. So if any one of you that have lived in the Barbizon would like to say a little uh, thing, please raise your hand. I'll ask you to unmute. Um, I see a few um, on the chat. So if you're willing to talk, if you want to talk, um, the raise hand function is in the bottom of your screen under reactions. Can and I just, I'll give you, yeah. Yeah, I just want to preface this by saying to, to all of you, I'm delighted to hear anything because I have to say, um, a year before the book came out, I started to brace myself for this, that all these women I was desperately in search of would now suddenly that the book came out would be writing to me and telling me wonderful stories that I could no longer include in the book. So I braced myself for it, but it has been a joy actually. Um, even as you know, there's the sorrow of not being able to include these stories in the book. Um, it has been a joy of, of hearing these things. I've learned fascinating things. So I'm very, I'm, I'm thrilled that people can tell me more. So Susan, I see your hand raised. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. You're gonna to have to confirm that. Okay, I unmuted. Uh, just to, uh, I, I did put it in the chat, but I was the Barbizon in the summer of 65 between my first year at Barnard, my senior year, second year at Barnard, my last year at Barnard. And my, the reason I ended up bar, the Barbizon is because my parents knew that I was renting an apartment downtown with a friend in a, in a townhouse without a doorman. He said, you cannot come to New York City. 
and do that. You could, we'll pay, give this girl your everything you owed her over the summer, the, the two months, we'll pay her, and, but you're moving to the Barbizon. That's why I did it. And that, <laughs> yes. And one other thing, the a canopy on the side is new. Yeah, building. exactly right. And, um, and I, I wanted to say, I'm so glad you actually brought that up because that was such a common story. And in fact, when Betsy Talbot Blackwell decided in the in the when she started the contest in the mid in the early 1940s, um, the reason that all the guest uh, editor um, contestant winners would stay at the Barbizon was because she had to find a way to have their parents sign off that they could come to New York. They were in college. So they it was anywhere between 18 and 22. And, and often these women were actually flying in and flying was not as common as it is today. This was a big deal. And they were being, un, you know, got, coming to New York unchaperoned. So they had to have the guarantee um, that they would be safe. And that meant the Barbizon. And indeed, Grace Kelly's father, the same thing. Um, women, uh, many women have told me that that was the, that was the agreement. They, they cajoled, they begged, they could come to New York and often would come down to, you can come to New York if you stay at the Barbizon because of the sense of safety from the wolves of New York. Um, and so safety on many levels, right? I was also on the Mademoiselle board. You were, oh, you were a board member. I, I didn't, I wasn't selected as an editor. But you're a board member, that's fabulous. All right, I'm gonna bring in Marjorie. I am asking you to unmute. Uh, you will have to confirm. Let me see. Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, hi there. I, I am older than a lot of you. I lived at the Barbizon for about a two years having graduated Smith College in 1957. And I encountered a bunch of unpleasant roommate and so forth experiences. So I sort of gravitated toward a safe environment, which it really was. And I was very happy because having been at a very competitive college and having a job in TV, which was competitive and alien to me, I suddenly met a bunch of women who was doing the same thing I was doing. We had no housekeeping. We, we had dinner out every night. It was very companionable and no competition. And the rooms were small, but what did we know? It was like the college rooms. Exactly. It was, the transition home. was nothing, yeah. My father was paying for the room like he did at college and I'm riding free and I enjoyed it very much. And I didn't know that it wasn't the most luxurious place. And um, I enjoyed my stay there very much. Yeah, and I think, and and, Exactly, you're absolutely right. Um, it was it, for many women. It, that's that's what they know. They especially you know in growing up in the 1950s, or coming of age in the 1950s. That sort of gender segregation and also dormitory life was so common that in in many ways it it not just eased the transition, but it made the Barbizon feel very comfortable. Very. I also want to say, I, I love how you're saying that you were, you know, in these competitive environments in that sense. Um, I always, when, you know, giving a talk about this book, it's so hard for me because the, 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 you know, the, the complexities have to sort of be removed to give a 35 minute talk. Um, but it really, in many ways, is a history, a, a tale of women um, feeling ambitious, trying to find ways to express it, trying to maneuver in a world where um, it, it was frowned upon. Um, and yet also being in places like the Barbizon where there were other women trying to do this. Um, and also not everybody was successful, but the idea that you went and tried, I think, it, you know, not you, I mean, but one went and tried um, all these small town American women or, or large town American women, but that they came to New York and that they tried especially in these decades that was so difficult, you know, it just hats off to them. And it, it's fascinating to me. Thank you. All right, well, um, I'll give some time for people to raise their hands if they wanna talk it again, but I'm gonna ask a question while we're waiting. 
Paulina, um, was there uh, like a, a very inter what was the most interesting story that you found out when you were researching the book? Um, to me, um, um, it was, as I said, for me, I found it fascinating to contrast famous women with women who were there doing the same thing and we don't know their names. Um, and with Sylvia Plath, I sort of, sort of put her in a sense next to this woman called Neva Nelson. Um, and, and Plath had had, so the biography of Plath is, is that she'd had a hard time. Her father was a professor, died early. Um, her mother was teaching students to type and trying to keep up appearances and keep up um, sort of the, the social and financial standards for Plath and, and her brother. Um, and obviously we all know Plath was tortured with, with mental illness. Um, Neva Nelson came from California. Uh, she was one of the guest editors who'd been picked as well. Um, she had actually been a ward of the state since she was a baby because her parents, they were alive, but they on and off just couldn't take care of her. They had problems with addiction and so forth. Um, and to me, listening to her and then, I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's in the book, but it's personal. So it's, it's hard for me to talk about, but, but while she was there being wined and dined on exact same parties as, as Sylvia Plath and Plath seemed to have real sort of ambivalence toward Neva Nelson uh, because Plath really struggled with, with sort of her sexual desire and also the mandatory sort of sexual repression if you were a woman in the 1950s. And, and she wrote about that a lot. Um, and, and, so she Neva was was uh, was I wouldn't say Neva didn't abide by the rules as much. Part of it was because she was from California. But anyway, but but through all of this, it ended up actually um, Neva ended up having an unwanted pregnancy from one of these gatherings um, at this time where Sylvia Plath was. And sort of the way her story goes and the way Sylvia Plath's story goes, it, it to me, it ends up that for both of them, the story of, of that repressive nature and sort of the, the compromises and the situations that young women were being put into, sort of one really highlights the other. So for me, that's, I think in some ways is, is something that's very important to me. Um, I also, well, I could go on, but I won't. But, but that to me is, is a moment that I find um, really touching, informative, reflective of so many different sort of threads that are take, sort of interwoven in the 1950s. And I wanted to, I see some people have sort of some questions I can answer easily. Um, in its original format, did the rooms have their own bathrooms? Well, the luxury rooms had their own bathroom or a shared bathroom with another um, room, but still a, a little more than half the rooms had bathrooms that were on the hallways. So the guest editors, Plath and so forth, Didion, they were all in, of course, in the cheap rooms where there were um, the bathrooms in the hallways. And in the case of Plath, and she writes about this in the bell jar in the novel, um, they did actually all get food poisoning from one of the luncheon events that they had. And so it was all 20 young women, two bathrooms, uh, just like running in one after another, <laughs> the stench of, you know, sick <laughs> everywhere. It was really, it, it was quite something. So yeah, they, they had to, they had to deal with um, too few bathrooms on the hallway. All right. Um Someone uh, mentioned uh, the Dollhouse book, uh, mm -hmm. a novel. Uh, do you have you read it, and do you know if it it is historically accurate? Um, I haven't read it. When it came out, I read reviews, so I I'm a historian. I love to read fiction, but I'm a historian. So if if you're writing about a certain period 
uh, time period and there's something that's not right, it, it, it doesn't sit well with me. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> I totally understand. Um, so another question is, uh, did the age of the residents trend young or were there uh, older, older women residents too? Uh, great question. Definitely trended young without a doubt because that's how it advertised itself, right? Um, I start the book with talking about um, the unsinkable Molly Brown, the survivor of the Titanic. She was one of the first residents there and she had never really, I mean, she was constantly sort of in a public argument with flappers. Um, so she, and yet she went to the hotel where the flappers were. Uh, but she was a very, I mean, she was a fascinating woman, uh, radical for her time, very progressive. So she went there, she died there too, of an aneurysm in her room. Um, so, and, and there were incidents, certainly during the Great Depression, um, I, was, I have an incident there of, of a mother from the South and her two teenage daughters. Um, and the father I think was a banker and he just left the family. And this was the Great Depression. They went up to New York and they shared one room at the Barbizon and they all found work um, in some capacity. And the Barbizon, I have to say, as strict as it was, as strict as the front desk staff was, as much as they would confiscate any kind of electrical appliances where somebody asked about eating, of course, everybody tried to cook in their rooms. So they had a closet full, they could, they could have opened a shop with what they confiscated. As, you know, as much as they, you know, it was a it was a joke that that the uh, that may Sibley who was at the front desk for many many decades she would be brought to the desk routinely um, in the evening where somebody was pretending to be an on-call gynecologist and they'd come dressed as a doctor because the one man who was allowed in to the bedrooms was actually an upper east side gynecologist but of course a lot of men who were trying to get in uh, followed suit so um, so they were very good at turning, turning them away and knowing who was who. But for all of this, I have to say the amount of stories that I heard and read in about how generous they were, about women who, who that, you know, suddenly their salaries went down, they weren't getting modeling jobs or they were just starting out and they couldn't afford their room and they would just go and sleep on the floor of a friend's room and they'd vacate their room so they wouldn't have to pay for it. And the staff didn't say anything, but they would send phone messages up to that room. Um, and that kind of loyalty also meant when the women, this happened all the time, then they were, their salary was back, you know, back where it needed to be. And they'd, you know, move out of their friend's room and rent a room again. Um, so there was a lot of sort of give and take and kindness um, in, in terms of understanding that this was, this was a vital place for women to live. Right. Um, so we're going to end the night with one last uh, uh, comment. Jerry has her hand up and I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, you should confirm my muting. Uh, you thank go. you, Paula. I absolutely love the book. And I, um, what happened with me is that I can remember I arrived and pulling up an Oscar was there and it was the Saturday before Labor Day of 1972 originally from Michigan and everything you said was great a lot of the women who were staying there at the time were also from Toby Coburn yes. that was the other um, yes. and what was right across the street was Joe Namath had just opened his bar Bachelors Ooh. 3 Oh, so this, I know I kept looking for that, you know, in the book and I thought I'm going to share that with it's you. It's one of those things I was not <laughs> able to find out. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just fabulous. And what happened is that after 48 years being in New York City, um, kind of COVID and all that, we moved to Sarasota, Florida. Mm -hmm. And we have a wonderful bookstore on the corner. And the owner was there and she was talking to a young woman and she said, oh, this book came in and I'll, I'll have to take a look at it. It's about the Barbizon Hotel. And I couldn't see the woman, but I said, I stayed there. And all of a sudden this woman came around the corner and, and she said, what? I said, I stayed there. And she said, would, would you like to be the reader of the book? 
<laughs> and tell me whether I should purchase it or not. And I said, oh my God, I, I would love it. And I went back there and all over Sarasota, I started telling women down here, junior league and everything. Yes. And I was stunned at how many said I stayed there too. But the one thing I want to end with is that in the room, and it's true, they were so small, that one little like twin bed, the bathroom down the hall, and you could only get one station on the radio. Oh, and that it was famous radio above the bed. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> W.O.R. Rambling with gambling. And <laughs> And uh, so I just want to say thank you. I, it's uh, when you make a move and you're trying to remember your own past and then to have this book come out and it was just wonderful. So you made my transition easier. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, the response, I mean, the reviews have been amazing. Um, but and the press coverage, uh, but the response has been great. And 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 even the young'uns, even the young'uns are reading it and, and getting in touch with me. So I, I hope, you know, I think it's such an important history right. um, and, and a fascinating look at New York. So I, I think hopefully will appeal to a lot of people. Yes, well, this has been wonderful. As a reminder, the link to purchase the book is on the chat. Um, and this, again, was an event that was uh, part of MAS James Walk. Friends has another uh, on-demand tour happening as well. That is a, a series of 1980s photos of the Upper East Side. And Paulina, thank you so much. This, is, this was wonderful. Oh, it's great to learn more about the history of this building and these women, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for talking to thank us. You. It was a pleasure, everybody. I wish I could see you all, but have a lovely evening. Have a great time. See you.